Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 605. This is 605 of the Agostino Zinger Show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. It's the first podcast of the month, actually, which is quite wild to think that I've waited until six days into the month to record a podcast, but I'm here nice and clear coming at you wherever you may be. And it happens to also be Sober October. It is Sober October, one of my favorite parts of the year, because I get to kind of calm down and chill out with my drug and alcohol in, you know, um, consumption and basically get to be a little bit proper, be a little bit correct, be a little bit clean and hopefully come out of the other side a lot more stronger, a lot skinnier and a way more healthier mind state. And I'm pumped, 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 pumped for this year's Sober October. My plan overall for what I'm doing this time is that I'm obviously adopting what the guys are doing on the Joe Rogan podcast, which is Tom Segura, Ari Shafir, and Burt Chrysler. They are obviously doing the challenge um, by doing it, you know, um, what they're doing to work out. Also, they're going to try and burn 500 calories per day, and they'll work out every single day. And then, but the other thing they haven't done is give up something, which I'm going to give up. So the first thing to go is obviously Instagram usage. So I'm not going to be uploading or posting on my Instagram for the entirety of my sober October. I've committed to checking Twitter one at one um, hour per day because I have to kind of check for the news I have to do on this podcast, unfortunately. But if I wanted if I wanted to, my overall goal would be to completely avoid it. But I need to have one source or place where I can kind of go and check out the news I need to kind of upload on here. So that's obviously something I have to do. And then I'm going to commit to doing an hour of reading a day. And also do an hour of Duolingo a day. And that's my kind of overall commitment I'm doing. So I'm just still doing the working out, still doing the burning of 500 calories per day. Um, I'm sticking to a diet, which obviously is good too. So I'm getting rid of all the junk food. I'm also intermittent fasting, which is kind of another thing I'll add on to it. But that's essentially the things that I'm trying to do. 500 calories per day, um, working out once per day. Um, what's that I say? Um, sticking to my diet at the moment, which is basically not eating shitty food, intermittent fasting, which I'm doing at the moment, a 16-8 in terms of 16-hour fasting, 8-hour window of eating, and then the, no, oh, sorry, 18-hour window of fasting, 6-hour um, window of eating, and then the other thing is reading, and of course, the Duolingo, so those are the things I'm going to be running through, so I'm really excited to kind of get that going for the next month or so, and I'm hoping by the end of the month, not actually hoping, my intention for the end of the month is to make sure that I'm under at least under at least under 240 at least under 240 that's the obviously main goal but if i can get down to lower than that i'll be absolutely over the moon but that'll be my kind of my least goal at the moment because now i think i'm like 275 i weighed myself at the start of the month i was like god damn i'm 275 pounds i i, I guess i don't I, maybe i don't look it at, or maybe I, in my head i don't think i look it but shit man um my peak 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 at the time where i was kind of really going for it was 200 no i got down to 187 that was my lowest i could i got down to i managed but then i maintained 220 200 pounds to 220 for a while but then obviously over the pandemic i just flipping ballooned up kind of got lazy and didn't really stick on my stings and just you know loads of just basically basically living a sedentary lifestyle mostly the reason why i ended up weighing that way i did because i think even before then i still think i was eating crap but i kind of offset the crap eating by you know at the time i was working in central london and i live not in central london and it took me let's say it took me an hour and a half to get to work on my bike so i'd be i'd be riding basically 13 miles maybe a marathon yeah it was a marathon per day i was riding back and forth to work on my pedal bike sometimes it'll break and it'll die but for the most part i was riding back and forth all the time um a marathon every single day i was working out here and there so even if i did indulge in some five guys or shake shack or i went and had some chicken wings it didn't really matter because i was legitimately sweating and perspirating so much every single day but when the pandemic happened and then suddenly we were all sedentary and the one reason you know and also i was going through a bit of a tough time not having a job and stuff like i wasn't in the greatest of space in kind of going out in terms of working out and i didn't really push for it and then once i didn't push for it and i started ordering ubers and stuff twice in the week that's when i knew things were gonna go bad you know what i mean when you start ordering uber eats two times in the week you're like oh shit it's not gonna go good for me so i'm happy that i'm finally back on that and kind of getting and that corrected and then hopefully by the end of no, my intention is not hope my intention is at the end of the month i'll be under 240 and i'll look absolutely amazing just imagine if i get under 200 in a month imagine losing 70 pounds in a month that's flipping insane 
but it is possible. I know people have done crazy things. Maybe they've lost up to 40. But if I end up losing 70 pounds in a month and I go down to 200, that would be absolutely wild. But, you know, stranger things have happened. So let's see what I go on. Let's see what I go on. Um, apart from that, what else has been happening in my world? Obviously, my United stuff, I'm not going to talk about because it's depressing. I'm not going to talk about that at all. And I've obviously missed a bump to talk about it anyway. So I'm happy that's, that's over. And doing match reactions of my United now, the Glazer ownership is absolutely excruciating. Seeing what's everything that's happening with the club, seeing what's happening with the players these entitled morons the way they flipping turned out against man city and just essentially gave them their asses i'm not going to talk about that i can't i can't do it the fact that you know man city have basically got a generational striker playing up front for the moment in erling Haaland, who looks like he's been created in a lab and seems like he, he basically finds it harder to not score than to score and the crazy thing about Haaland at man city if you haven't watched him at Borussia dortmund he does score amazing goals because like, the meme that moment on twitter is that he only scores tappings but the scary thing that i thought was if man city did attain and were able to secure the signing of erling highland i always said the scary thing about him is not that he scores those crazy you know 30 yard goals or bicycle kicks or flying headers no it's the fact that he's he can score tappings the fact that he can score tappings, like he's bread and butter is tappings, back post, running in front post, getting in front of the defender. Like those are his bread and butter, but he can also score bangers. So playing for a team like Man City, where they basically, their style of play, where they have these really cool triangles and passing patterns, which essentially give the attackers an opportunity to kind of run into the box last minute and get the ball, run into the box at, you know, at the first instance that a, a, a player is on the wing. They've got these little triggers all over the pitch where they know where to run into certain spaces because the ball is going to arrive at a space that they're going to be at and then they're going to be able to slot in the net. That's the scary part because he's going to score those happens all day long because Man City had created at least, at least three of those chances that go across the goal three times a match. So he's scoring all these goals now with tappings. Just imagine when he starts to dribble outside the box and bend one in with his left or his right foot or bicycle kick and stuff. We're going to be, honestly, uh, it's just all that is depressing. So I'm not going to talk about football. So let's just skip all that stuff. So um, I went out on a friday last weekend actually i went to this night called workhouse which is pretty decent i went after actually meeting some friends out in dawson which i haven't been in ages went to dawson for a um friend of a friend's birthday party which was pretty decent not going to lie um it was in the really cool um new like taco type of bar thing mexican inspired bar that's really amazing in terms of the layout because the front of it is kind of got this little foyer bit this little kind of you know whatever bit outside the bit but it's also underneath it's like a strange thing combination um in terms of build especially on in, in, you know kings and roads a bit of a, odd to have those kind of buildings but it's essentially got a, a little entrance that you can walk into that's kind of you know got a roof on it but it's outside so you, if you want you can just sit there and smoke and drink but then it's also got an inside with music and a bar and stuff and table so it's perfect little mix and they serve food too and the food's meant to be pretty banging so all that made it to be quite a good location to go and have a little bit of a birthday celebration and hang out so i was going to stay out with those guys they were going to go do some super sober i already had this plan already in mind and i wanted to go to workhouse present sweat with finn your hands which i have up in the screen it was at this new club called workhouse which is on brick lane now I remember seeing this featured a few places. I saw pictures of it, but I couldn't actually picture where it was at on Brick Lane because Brick Lane's a long, you know, it's a long street, loads of nice, cool little, you know, um, Indian restaurants and whatnot, vintage stores, all the usual stuff you associate with Brick Lane. But the clubs are pretty dead set in terms of where they are, in terms of, you know, next to Truman Brewery. There's a couple further down to the end next to Commercial Street that people don't go to. I think it's called a pair something, but I couldn't picture where this workhouse place is where it was meant to be. So I was walking up and down, couldn't figure it out. And then only when I went to the the bit that leads up to uh cafe 1001 there's a little gate there with a the security guard there was, you know where they serve the burgers and stuff. i was like hey where's this workhouse place he's like oh it's upstairs so this whole time i was walking up and down and even on the google maps it shows that workhouse is like further down the road but it's not it's actually a room upstairs you know at, on top of cafe 1001 it's essentially another room in cafe 1001 if you've ever been to brick lane you'll know what i mean by cafe 1001 it's like one of the main little spots there it's got like a restaurant a little bar thing there's a club there people hang out blah 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 so i finally went up there went up there and it was interesting to go up there because it was a game you flashbacks of why i stopped promoting because when i went up there i think it might have been like because i left the party quite late 
So it might have been like 11.30, 12 or something I got there and it was empty, like empty, empty. And it got me flashbacks of like how my bum used to clench when I used to promote my own parties in Dawson and how excruciatingly tough it is, which is why I have so much sympathy and so much respect for people who are going out there and putting on nights because look, this was an RA pick night, right? It got all the good buzz that you need to get in terms of putting on nights. It had a pretty stellar DJ who I think is pretty well regarded and rated. He has a really cool long running series that Paloma called uh, Powerhouse. Um, he's also a really prominent um, writer. Um, you know, runs his label. He's got a blog that I used to read, you know, religiously for a few years because of obviously, you know, me being obsessed with Berlin and stuff and everything concerning club culture around there. He writes some really cool articles about that. That's not some of them I had to, you know, run for a Google Translate, but still just a really solid dude that you'd think would have a lot of pull in terms of getting people to come out on a Friday night. And especially it being payday, yeah, you'd think people would be coming out, right? This is a, it was one of the rare weekends where payday fell on the weekend. So even if you got paid the day before or you got paid on the Friday, you definitely had money for the weekend. So you could afford to maybe go out and have a bit of fun and, you know, let your hair down. But it wasn't, it wasn't the case. The place was absolutely empty when I arrived. And I think I might arrive there if I'm thinking correctly. It was 11.45. So I gave it time to kind of build up because the club, you know, the party was on from 10 till 4 a.m. And I still got there and it was empty. So that shows to me that promoting is still as hard as it's ever been. So if you're a punter out there and you're unable to go to events, I honestly do think, as weird as it sounds, because I know I've said the opposite in past, you know, podcasts, if you can't go to the event, just give the, way, give the ticket away to somebody else. Don't even try and resell it. I do it all the time. There's a little... um there's a little whatsapp group that we're in now where there's like loads of you know london techno fans and stuff that you know if you want to go to a party but you don't want to go on your own you can kind of link up with people and i'm sure there's other places too you can find on telegram and on discord and stuff little communities or just go on the techno subreddit or the house subreddit whichever one you want to go on and just give the ticket away to somebody i'm sure somebody will like it especially if it's sometimes i've been i've done it on twitter too i've just written the, the event so somebody somebody's searching for it they can see it's hey i've got a free ticket here for somebody you want to come dm me and i'll send it to you and just give the ticket away because refunding it, especially considering how tough it is to promote out there, is a bit of a piss take, especially because some of these parties aren't making enough money to break even. It's just difficult to get people out post-pandemic. Things have changed really out there. It's not the same. I know it's still hard to get people out, but it's, things have definitely changed culturally, I feel like, in terms of people deciding to leave their home to go and to go and play or to go and sorry, dance at these sort of parties and clubs like things people's habits and lifestyles are really changed i don't think they'll go back to how they were before i think if anything i've i've always stressed this but i think overall the club landscape we've definitely lost the general punter like the regular guy that's just or regular gal that would go out and hang out and just kind of oh i'm out on a friday let me just see what x or y is saying let me see what fabric is saying let me see what venue mt is saying let me see what for that general punter has gone we've lost them so i think now the people that are going out are legit fans so that's a way smaller crowd though you need also gen pop people to also maybe have an interest in you for you to kind of you know sustain that for a long term so it's a bit shaky out there and obviously with the clubs closing blah 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 you know the general stuff so anyway i go there it's a bit, it's a bit empty and then the first thing another thing i want to check is all that i want to check is all first thing i've said that i think i've changed my mind on lineups and set list if you don't see a set list there at the club or they don't produce one just enjoy your night I think going up and asking somebody, hey, what time is somebody on? I felt kind of gross because I think when I did it, I think I asked somebody behind the decks who was involved with the with the, with the the party who I shared some words with and whatever it may be, words of encouragement or whichever that I could. And I did feel a little bit gross walking away. I'm not going to lie. I did feel like a little bit like a dickhead. Like, why am I asking them what time Finney on Chance is coming on as if the whole party only rests on the value of one person playing? Obviously, it does. But it's a bit rude to say. Do you know what I mean? It's not like the, it's not the, um, it's not the polite thing to say, um, in that space. I think if someone doesn't produce a set list, sorry, it doesn't produce a DJ set list, whatever, and who's playing what time, you don't see one online, so someone didn't snap on quickly, whatever, maybe, then let it go. Talking about pictures, um, weirdly enough, Workhouse has this thing where they tape your pick camera up when you go. So it's a another club that's trying to recreate this whole Berlin thing about not taking pictures. Personally, for me, I think it's a bit redundant in London overall. I think Fold do it really well in some places, other places do it well, like some of the king parties that we have, like Crossbreed and Verboten when they were, when, when they were here for a bit. Um, but overall, I don't think it works in London. Our punters just don't get it. Um, if anything, it makes people a little bit more anxious when they're on the dance floor. The vibe kind of changes. It's just strange. We don't really vibe it that well. We don't. We haven't really been educated in 
why that's beneficial why it matters why it's necessary we don't get it so it just doesn't work but weirdly enough i think it did work with this one i'm not going to lie especially considering how less how small the crowd was i think it kind of added to the fact that people were just ready to just dance and just let themselves go and not really be bothered about what was going on because there was hardly anyone there in the first place so that was good but then it did start to fill up so a couple, couple of hours passed by and it just started to get a bit busier around 1 a.m so that was pretty decent and um Finn Johansson started end up coming on I think about one if not one half one or something around that kind of mark and absolutely smashed it um again I'm a fan of his um in general um it's weird because someone asked me actually what type of music he's playing I was actually quite stumped in terms of genres because you, I would say new disco um i would say disco i'd say ebm electronic body music i don't know what else i would kind of um link it to right but even just looking at some of the um people featured right on his list of djs or the, or the cloud there's so many different kind of artists that kind of span across different spans in terms of who you're trying to touch it's kind of hard to kind of pinpoint it but obviously luckily i recorded some clips in there um so you can kind of see um, or you can kind of hear what the sound was like with Finn Johansson playing. This is obviously not Finn Johansson at the start. This is mostly at the beginning. Um, but some of the DJs are playing that warming up who are fairly good also. I have to kind of point that out. I'm not really sure who was what, who was who on the lineup and stuff. But this is the start of it. And then I'll kind of scrub through so you can see the couple of other bits in the middle as well. Let's play this. <laughs> for a bit. And here. I think that might have been me banging on something but yeah absolutely amazing and also to kind of to bring a little kind of quick point on this the bartenders there were super cool man I, I don't know if this is something that doesn't necessarily happen in those kind of places so i'm kind of shocked because usually brick lane you know attendees and people that work in the area are a little bit sketch if you know that area but the bartenders at that club were so cool um um, so one of them made me a really great refreshing drink that I was you know happy to have because it was the last day of me drinking alcohol especially with sober October coming up and yeah I had a blast man so the staff that worked they were pretty cool security guards were also on a, on a good vibe thing so everything was good about that place I'm not going to lie I was just disappointed obviously for people pointing on that not a lot of people turned out for it but talking about that also the, the one thing that really I think was interesting was that Obviously, I've been to Palomas, right? So I've been to this legendary club in Berlin, which is like on Copper Sator. Um, it's right as you come out there. It's like next to the river. It's kind of like an upstairs thing, right? It's really, really cool. And, it's, and I think it's one of the better clubs in Berlin because it kind of covers a, a wider range of music. It's not just the same what you hear everywhere, like techno, techno, techno. Same like same heads, right? You might not like same heads. It might be a bit too kitschy for you, a bit too out there, but at least they try to get people in that kind of cover a broad spectrum of art. It's not just the same dark techno industrial sort of music. So that's why I love um, Paloma. And obviously they um, have a lot of house people there. And obviously that, that can... You can kind of say that's my foundation in terms of music, dance music education, like house, disco, all that sort of stuff. So I kind of lean to that, even though I've, I'm obviously you know obsessed with techno also. But the problem with people like Afin Johansson is that 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 rave that he has on that flipping um, what's it called at um, at Palomas, right? Called Powerhouse is legitimately one of the best parties i've been to in a while like i've been twice as well and i want to catch it hopefully another time before the end of the year or maybe next, the beginning of next year and it legitimately is the best platform or the best place to kind of see him do his thing or to kind of see why he's such a well-regarded dj because usually you'll have somebody playing with him it's usually like two people um it's usually just him and somebody else like so it's like a back-to-back -back type of affair and it's a great 
um, night because usually he picks people that he feels like, you know, are like a DJ's DJ, somebody that kind of compliments him well. Somebody he's just a fan of. It's never really that big, high ticket people. But sometimes, you know, a big high ticket person who's having a bit of a pop, like a synthy can come down, right? And play. And I've listened to the set. It's like a seven hour recording of, you know, of flipping Powerhouse with, you know, flipping Vinny Hansen and synthy playing. And it's amazing, right? Just peak elite level house music. And unfortunately, once you hear that sort of sound in that sort of club, on that sort of sound system, in that city, it's just the perfect representation of what he's trying to do. So when you hear it, try to be replicated in a brick lane club that's a bit weird layout wise that's upstairs a really shitty bar it's a bit it doesn't really work the same but i do appreciate them at least trying to do it and make it happen right but it just wasn't it just didn't hit the same way and again it's not their fault it's just that when somebody's intrinsically tied to such an amazing place like they even got it underneath his name right his night powerhouse paloma they've even got it and i'm sure the people around it probably did probably had the same you know earth shattering realization that i did when they went to see him play that oh my god it's the greatest teacher i've ever seen in my life and obviously got you know him and got in touch with him in terms of playing there but it's just not the same so that's the only issue i think i have with this sort of nice i think if he came into as a general partner it's one thing but if he came into as a fan of finn Hansen, it probably isn't the best platform to have seen him but still as somebody who's obsessed with the music obsessed with the scene in general just to hear him play out i didn't fucking care where it was it could be in a car park i would still have fun i still have a way of a time i was sweating dancing my face off until what 4 a.m or 5 a.m or something and then end up coming back home unfortunately i didn't take my bike with me so i ended up having to flipping get an uber back but that was fine you know able to get some fresh air walk a little bit down brick lane um so to make the flipping uber ride home a bit cheaper it's your usual kind of hack i'm sure most of you guys do it too they just kind of walk a bit further out from the main city center to kind of get uh, discounted rates and i was able to kind of get back home pretty sharpish and all all together it worked out well but i'm just some cool people as well in the dance floor so pick up anybody i might have seen there um that was also really enjoyable but yeah overall that was kind of what i spent my weekend doing because of course the next day was the start of sober october so that was what i kind of got up to if you were wondering now moving on i want to talk about this because this is something that's been on my mind it's something that i've heard um, a little clip of russ on dj academic show kind of talking about this there's been this constant weird conversation going around in hip-hop especially regarding blackballing right and for the most part you know you guys will know what blackballing is in terms of you know um establishments or corporations basically putting the kaput on people's careers um to the point where they're not able to sustain themselves not able to be successful they were prior and i guess the baby's claim is that off the back of his new album that just came out called baby on baby which i'm surprised he's kind of standing behind because to me it sounds rushed and i'm and i'm and i'm somebody who's open-minded i'm not somebody that's kind of going to sit here and say i'm a baby fan but i'm also open-minded enough to kind of listen to someone's music and be able to discern why people like it and why some people wouldn't like it so i'm going you know, whatever it may be so i listen to the baby and baby with an open ear and it just feels rushed it feels like a mix it feels like something that he put out in the hopes of just you know ticking off or crossing off another album on his um list of albums he needs to turn in for his label it didn't feel like a project he'd worked on with a lot of full a lot of foresight there wasn't a real theme in it it's just a collection of his best quote-unquote songs and he put them on an album and he called it baby and baby 2 to kind of link back to the other album baby and baby but it wasn't good in my opinion it just wasn't so to stand behind a blackballing thing off of that is weird and also i felt like he didn't really promote baby and baby 2 that long there wasn't a big lead up to it it wasn't like you know usually when you're an artist and you're flipping putting an album you have this big lead up you go on radio shows you do interviews you do podcasts you maybe do a live stream or two but there's a rollout that you do when you're a new album and you didn't do any of that for all oh, for baby and baby so i don't really know why this whole blackballing thing has happened but anyway the baby's been speaking out i guess and basically letting people know that he's not happy with his album sales and he doesn't care also which is the classic thing people do that are really sensitive right and um, especially if you're somebody who's got such a hard and kind of gangster reputation as flipping the baby does right he's somebody also you know we all know he doesn't take any shit but he's clearly still an artist deep down so if your numbers aren't as good as your previous numbers you're clearly going to feel aware about it regardless of how you're going to try and say it or how you're going to try and twist the 
words in public, you're going to feel something for sure. So anyway, it continues. This article from Complex that says, Baby's recent album, Baby and Baby, garnered low sales um, than his previous project. And Charlotte Rapper thinks it's because he's being blackballed. The release of his project to more to projected to move 16,000 units in the first week. In contrast to Baby's previous solo record, 2002's Blame It On The Baby, debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and moved 124,000 album equivalent units per billboard still the baby wasn't sweating and tepid progressions and gave himself a pat on the back so this is a screenshot from his um uh instagram story that says not bad for a blackboard baby and it's a picture of the baby selling he's saying you know being basically ironically and sarcastically saying you know he's happy he sold sixteen thousand a week um the baby's response comes shortly after academics argued the same thing and blamed apple music and ibra darden for blackballing a rapper and this is obviously um uh, what's this right? This is obviously a, a tweet from DJ Academics that says as follows The Baby's last project in 2020, Blame on the Baby, sold 124,000 first week. His new project after being blackballed by Ebro, Apple Music is scheduled to do less than 20k. Now you understand what my Ebro convert. DSPs control who is hot and who is not. Fall out of favor with them, you're done. And obviously, um, um, Ebro t- um, tweeted in response Apple Music is not the only platform. Based on his dummy's logic, the baby should be doing well on the platform he works for. Is it? The, the, the. anyway so you know it's not a toys whatever so for me personally i think this is a ridiculous conversation um because number one i never got the feeling because nia yeah, the, the reason why i think the black point conversation is, is is annoying first of all just to kind of piggyback on the back of this is i think that it's there's a lot of importance being placed on dsps right and i'm somebody who kind of in general, I'm not really the biggest fan of gatekeepers, right? I, I think all that sort of stuff is really, really um, annoying and kind of stifles creativity and opportunity. And what the internet gave us is the ability to basically, you know, leapfrog the gatekeepers and just give the music or give the con or put the content out there for the fans. And if you do, a- if you're able to connect with people out there, they will find you in some way, shape, or form, and you'll be able to garner a fan base and be able to support yourself through your artwork. That's been the great thing about the event of the internet and social media right but this kind of heavily heavy reliance on on playlists and and streaming platforms and stuff feels like a weird psyop from the streaming platforms to asset to kind of um restore or to cement their authority on the industry again because it was waiting for a long time the fact that you can upload your own songs you know and submit them to places like spotify and apple in the first place and get an artist profile and streaming basically if you wanted to on paper you could have every little thing that every artist has that you kind of idolize at your fingertips also right in terms of the tools that you use to kind of spread and push out their music but obviously it feels like also because the record labels have kind of now got in bed with some of these big streaming platforms by investing in them or having partnerships to allow them to put their music on their streaming platforms in the first place they are now through like backdoor psyop ways trying to uh, re-establish their authority dominance and control by having this weird black ball conversation thing that's going to strike fear in the heart of artists coming up that they shouldn't fall foul of digital streaming platforms because they too could end up like the baby and so 124 one week and then of course drop off the face of the earth with the next plat with the next album coming through but the reason why i don't like this is because kind of to touch on um russ's kind of comments on it is that in general what this does is that it admits for the most part that this over reliance on this over emphasis on numbers sorry first week sales streams and all this sort of nonsense that could easily be manipulated has essentially hurt the music industry and artists in general because artists are now chasing these numbers and but they're not chasing or trying to cultivate a fan base they're not trying to perfect their craft they're not trying to improve their live shows they're not trying to dig deep into their psyche or into their history and kind of pull out from a kind of deeper more interesting place it's all the same regurgitated nonsense microwavable disposable stuff that we don't care about and clearly the evidence is showing in the numbers because one minute you're hot next minute you're not but also overall to touch on what point russ said a really good point that i think kind of stresses it and kind of makes it more poignant to me and what i'm kind of going through and what i kind of want to strive for he said the following on his um twitter that he kind of put out there he said this no one is blackboard right this is a screenshot taken from his account i just want to give my two cents on something in the industry no artist is blackboard unless they cut off your wi-fi remove your social media accounts and take your music off the streaming platforms you are not blackboard if you're famous i can still tell your fans hey i'm putting out music then you're not blackboard fans will listen to your music or they won't it's that simple also if you're a famous artist and you need 
playlist in your order for you to your fans to listen to your music how real are your fans why do they support you why don't they support you regardless we're giving too much credit to power and power to dsps and not enough power to to us the artists and the fans i know for me as long as i can tell my fans i'm putting out music i'm straight i'm not entitled to any playlist nor do i need them for my fans to listen to me that's why they're dot dot my fans and i definitely agree with him because i think in this event maybe you could say or in this circumstance maybe you can say both points are right maybe the dj academics point about overall there is too much the, the, the DSPs basically have too much power in terms of the things that they can kind of put in the front of us the front of the home page the things they can feature on certain playlists there is that right and there's obviously some platforms they promote their own playlists ahead of other user generated players or stuff that's kind of come from you know outside of the company that makes complete sense obviously because it's their thing I get it but overall this is music especially should always be about the artistry itself should always be about the, the art connecting with the fans in some meaningful way and i feel like for whatever reason especially in hip-hop there's been this real um chase and first for numbers everyone's gonna chase the biggest bag the biggest first week sale it's all big it's all ownership it's all big grandiose things but at the end of the day there's less real talk about conversations around the artists like i've just seen a performance of kodak black on the bt awards performing super gremlin great outfit on the stage show looks you know interesting to say the least you know not really my thing but i get it and the performance was absolutely trash. He had the vocal track playing in the background, so basically him screaming over an MP3 of the song that you can really listen to on on flipping any streaming platform. So what's the point of you standing on the stage and performing? So the performance was terrible because of that. It kind of took you away from the performance altogether. But you don't hear those people talking about how oh, I've been working on my live show. Here's me rehearsing. Here's me, you know, you know, trying to rework or trying to, you know. Um, what's that word called trying to reverse engineer some of my previous tracks to try and get them to be instrumentals to play in live shows all this sort of stuff you don't really hear it's all just chasing first week sales why are my streams not this why this why that why that and i feel like in general like i said the art has suffered fans have suffered or maybe mostly the artists have suffered because they have no real understanding of who the actual fans are because they've been chasing virality and relevance and the babies may be a big big example of that he wanted to be the biggest rapper of all it kind of he kind of popped during the pandemic it felt like for the most part he was everywhere and everywhere at once and then also the the kind of elephant in the room is also the fact that no one really wants to mention the guy is not the most likable person in the world is he let's be honest he's not very likable and i think one thing that we know russ to be at one point was unlikable in his career and one thing i think he proved that most people proving now that especially with podcasters and people online like youtubers and stuff if you have your own fan base, it's essentially impossible for you to get blackboard and cancelled. Impossible. You can always have a career because your fans are always going to rock with you. And we've seen it happen to countless YouTubers, countless influencers, countless content creators, especially during the pandemic when people were bored and were saying crazy shit. If you had actual fans, it didn't matter. Like Molly May said what she said about the 24-hour thing. It didn't change a dot because people love that girl. So they didn't care that she said what she said and it came across disingenuous or whatever it may be. They loved it. Same goes for the Kim kardashian work comments you can't cancel people who have actual fans who watch support view and buy what they do and i feel like with the baby what he's suffering from is that he never cultivated his fan base and also during the time that he was famous or during the time he was popping up you know really really in a big level he did loads of things that people didn't like and i never understood that thing as well with came with the baby because he's obviously somebody that a lot of girls like he obviously kind of you know leans into that as well he's not i, I don't know i, I kind of get the feeling like he should maybe have more he should probably be he should probably have a fan base that looks similar to like a tyler creators right then then they fucking make meals really if you think about his music you think about his videos his personality and the way he looks he should maybe have more caucasian fans and more girls that he show in general but i don't think publicly feuding with your baby mother with whoever's right or wrong i don't care but just the, the the optics of it public feuding of her on instagram live calling her names and stuff belittling her all these things i don't think it enamors yourself to with like young girls it just doesn't and i don't even know what danny lay's appeal is to young girls who knows she might be their fucking rihanna i have no idea but i don't think it helped so that coupled with the music not really improving that much or not really going to new interesting places which i don't think it's a bit of a misnomer you know you have to create new music to you know but keep evolving whatever but still him not being likable 
um, he basically having no fans because he didn't really cultivate them. He just kind of rode off for the back of having viral hits that kind of blew and not really people caring about his albums for the most part. I think all of that kind of played into it personally for me. I think so, especially when it comes to the US side of things. That definitely played a part. Maybe he'd be fine in Europe and whatever, but these artists don't really care about coming to Europe or doing, you know, or coming to or settling in Europe and becoming a European act. They want to be a star where they're at so that makes complete sense but this whole blackballing conversation is absolutely bizarre it really really is but then also i was thinking where it could be applied the whole blackballing thing and i think is a more interesting conversation to have is what happened with tory lanes and megan and stallion now let's not get into who you believe shot who did it happen or didn't happen let's not get into that the issue i've always had with the tory lanes and megan stallion thing is the um is the unfairness of it optically right into again not knowing anything that happened wherever it may be but essentially you've got a he said she said issue yes you can sit there and say believe all the victims whatever but at the core of it it is a he said she said right we don't know what happened in that car we have no idea we know they had a prior relationship we know they all went to that same place together they left together something occurred in between them leaving and in between them quote unquote getting home that you know around the shooting that basically led to all this drama we're having at the moment but we haven't got down to the truth yet and most of it's because of the pandemic put like a kabush on court cases and things get getting pushed back bloody blah 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 we're finally gonna have a resolution i think i think in november i think the update's meant to be i don't know if you're sure but regardless of it what i really kind of disliked at the time was everybody essentially running to support Megan, but not even support in terms of she got shot. Most of the support in terms of the industry stuff, like the awards and whatever it may be, and the adulations and the the performances, it just felt really disingenuous and fake because they didn't feel like it was coming from a real place. They weren't really crediting her music. They were just crediting the fact that this person might be a victim. We want to uplift them, want to make them feel good about themselves and feel like they're kind of supported in this industry. Here, here you go. And I felt, in my opinion, that that was just a bad move overall because what if it transpires that what she said didn't happen or maybe that there's a slight you know changing of the narrative whatever it may be right there's whatever it may be it just didn't feel right and even if it, it didn't it did happen i would have just liked to have seen more fairness in terms of okay they went through a crazy situation we're trying to get to the bottom of it in the courts let's have them both sit out sit this one out in terms of you know let's just both take a step back from being in the public and stuff and doing all these performances and going to the grammys and winning them all this let's both take a step back pause our career you know do what we can do on the side and then whenever the case is over then we start popping back out and doing what we're doing or even the industry doing it but the fact that one person got all the awards and then one person was told to basically sit on the bench for the whole time and not get any kind of mainstream love it just felt a little bit weird um in general, and I think that is what you would call some version of blackballing. Even though Troy has his own fans, he was still able to do shows and stuff. That is a version of blackballing, like in terms of like, you know, it didn't matter how good his albums were in the times of, you know, there being Grammys, he was never going to win one. He could have submitted as much as you want. They were never going to pick it, never going to win it. So that is a bad thing. And of course, if the fans listen to it and it's the biggest hit in the streets and stuff, they wouldn't acknowledge it either. So that's a bit that I kind of get annoyed about and I think is really, really unfair. And there's this clip here taken from DJ Kenemis' podcast where T Tory Lanez kind of speaks about his hesitancy to talk about the topic at all and why he doesn't feel like you know he should because he essentially as it says in the quote is facing 24 years in prison next month so he doesn't really have the depression being a guy he doesn't have the luxury to you know kind of p politic about it or you know throw subs about it online for the most part because if he does it's going to hurt his case and i think he was doing at the start to be you know to be brutally honest he was being a little bit cheeky in the beginning you know so certain things in the albums that were said and whatnot certain indirect here and there but it seems like for the most part ever since he got hit with that is it like a restraining order or something by making or something on the lines he's completely shut up he's not really said a single word let everybody say what they want to say and he's going to have his day he's day in court and so we're going to see what the outcome is but this is a this is a video clip taken from dj kenobis uh, podcast called uh off the record where they talk about it a little bit you know the narrative can be against me but it's the narrative that's against me and it's me like you're saying it's me not defending myself in a lot of instances, in a lot of situations, what a lot of people don't realize is one thing connects to another. And when you start talking about one thing, people then connect it to something else. And sometimes 
most of the time, those things have no correlation to each other. And so because of that, it's like you avoid it in, in, in its entirety because it's not the time and place. You know what I'm saying? And, like, that's just wisdom. That's not about me trying to be too cool or me being like, yo, I'm too cool to give y'all the answer or I'm so patient or I'm so resilient or I'm so da-da-da-da-da. No, guys. I am in an open case, and maybe I make this shit look really beautiful, but I'm facing 24 yeah, you years. You don't seem too stressed, man. Like, I'm facing 24 years. I make this shit look beautiful, don't I? But, uh, uh, guys, I am actively facing 24 years next month. Wow. And it's funny that you have to explain that sort of stuff to people in plain language, but that's essentially the, the, the place that he's at. And even if this is the thing, even if he is guilty, it's probably best, especially in the court of public opinion, to just keep your mouth closed, even if you are guilty, because you know how much the court of public opinion can actually influence legit court cases. So if you actually are guilty of shooting somebody, especially a woman and you're a black dude, you kind of should keep your mouth quiet. And if you're not guilty, again, keep your mouth shut. But like I said, I feel like that was real blackballing. The fact that Megan was winning Grammys for stuff that she shouldn't have won Grammys for, you know, talented girl, don't get me wrong, but the album that she won, it's like, this, like come on, guys, this, the awards in general were just like crazy. What is going on here? Overcompensating for somebody that you feel like you know was victimized or was in a terrible situation, but you know you don't need to do that, or at least have some parity. If she gets one, he gets one too. But that obviously wasn't going to happen. So that's why I feel like real blackballing exists in that kind of capacity. But again, you know, maybe I'm kind of talking out my ass when it comes to those sort of topics. Um, anyway, moving on, we'll talk about this, and this is another topic to kind of go piggyback off the back of the whole like blackballing doesn't really exist sort of thing. This is a clip taken from the Joe Budden podcast, right? Which, again, I think, you know, I've said my piece about Joe Budden podcast. I was an OG fan of the podcast and it legitimately broke my heart when they all broke up and essentially went their separate ways. I feel like if we're being honest, as much as I love New Orleans more and as much as I'm happy about their deal, I'm going to go see their live show in November here in London. I love everything they do and I prefer that podcast over the JBP. Let's be honest. Both podcasts have suffered greatly for the fallout. Maybe Joe's been able to bounce back better than we expected because he's a really unlikable, um, hard to root for person in the same way that Kanye is. Um, I think someone mentioned in the subreddit recently that um, they call um, Joe, uh, Joe Budden Joe West. They said that he could be Kanye's cousin because they're both the same. They're incredibly unlikable, but they've got stands that ride for them. So it basically, you know, negates how unlikable they are and whatnot. But anyway, in general, I feel like they both kind of, you know, suffered podcast because of the fallout. I feel like they both should be stronger together, but that's never going to happen because, you know, Joe, when he falls out of people, it rarely ever comes back, especially his actual friends, which is what made that whole breakup in crazy to see because you felt like okay joe's only being a dickhead to people he doesn't really know even though he's awful you know it's not people that he knows and those actual friends they're industry friends but then when he did what he did to new rory or more to rory or more so new rory or more, to rory or more it was like oh i'm done with this guy so i've been down with there was a person for a long time i've kind of you know decided to hang up my hat listen to the podcast i listen to it all i check the sub here and there to see clips but i don't I haven't listened to a full episode of the show in sit not years well ever since they broke up so maybe it's been a year already but regardless this is a good example of why it's important to cultivate your fan base because in any other platform on in any other walk of life if joe budden said this he'd be done for right if he was on a radio station um if he was working in a corporate environment this is a sackable offense like like honestly sackable fan this is not me being a cancel guy this is just me saying this is the importance of having your own fan base and why podcasters and youtubers are winning so hard because once you have a fan base they essentially accept you for your ills because they listen to you for more than some people put out what 10 hours plus of free content every week it's very difficult to hide who you actually are underneath 10 you know hours of content it's very difficult you can do i'm sure but for the most part people would see the ugly sides of you they'll notice little bits here and there right you can't hide everything so usually those fans are the ones that accept you for who you are and then of course you know kind of reward them by giving them all this free content that they can kind of enjoy so i think a lot of jbp fans myself included we knew what he was really like the whole time we just kind of went to suspend belief because we couldn't ever imagine him doing you know you know kind of you know being running afoul with his friends we couldn't imagine that being the thing we only could imagine him doing that to people he didn't know 
But then also, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, the guy's a bit of a weirdo when it comes to girls, right? And this clip taken from his podcast where he basically says, the caption says here, Joe admits that he has faked putting on a condom during sex on a recent episode of his podcast. And this is obviously taken down. He, I think he edited it or he took it down. I think he was edited out the podcast. I think this is during the whole podcast. And ever since then, you know, obviously nothing was said publicly about it until he made a post recently where he was replying to a fan and he basically said he's going to be in, in he kind of insinuated or said in roundabout terms, he's considering putting his whole podcast behind a paywall so he can avoid all these issues. So not even like apologizing for this weird comment. I'm going to put it behind a paywall because you're, you know, you guys are like trying to make out like I'm a bad dude by doing this, which obviously he is. But let's play the clip of him saying sometimes he forgets to put, sometimes he pretends to put a condom on if a girl asks him to put a condom on. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> what? I have no idea, no one. No. You, you do the. And even I done walked in the corner and fake like I was putting a condom on before. You'd <laughs> 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 be working. What? <laughs> no. what? Of course, Parks was the one that laughed the loudest, right? With his flipping Joe Budden cock in his mouth, like, God damn, that guy is so annoying. I'm the wiser. <laughs> what do you mean, what? <sighs> yes, you, I did that. You, you faked the put one. Thousand percent. That was that was my that was my poor. I'm asking. That was my poor no. execution of my of my plan after I mastered it, which was to just bust through the lambskin. <laughs> Let me go find. I don't know the, if I ever use the lambskin. Let me skin. go find the thinnest condom you, in the you, world. You, you, you mastered doing bust, that, huh? <laughs> bust through it. Yeah. You plan to bust. Yeah, yeah I'm not having it, but I don't. <laughs> Yo, what? Oh man, this guy. Yo. That's the importance of having actual fans. Because if you have actual fans that rock with you, they're willing to accept stuff like that. So when you when people do try to cancel you like the Shade Room does with Joe Budden, I think every time he says something risque, it doesn't actually make a difference. It doesn't do anything. Absolutely zero. That's the importance of having real fans. That is definitely the importance. But anyway. So about that moving on. Let's, um, oh yeah, let, let me talk about something I got. So um, obviously I was talking on this podcast recently about wanting to buy some Supreme products from the recent drop. And I had my eye on the Iraq collaboration that they had. And obviously, um, you know, most of you guys will know I'm a flipping big fan of Iraq in general and what Kuhn Lay has done. And obviously, you know, the other members, RIP Sace and whatnot, just generals of graffiti crew. And the things they put over the years, it's probably one of my first introductions to flipping graffiti actually through streetwear. Which is why I probably maybe ride for streetwear so hard because, you know, it's basically gave me everything I have in life in terms of interest and personality and whatnot has kind of come through the lens of streetwear from skate videos to skateboarding to design to furniture design to flipping interior design to architecture to movies everything I've kind of got through the lens of streetwear for references one way or the other has kind of come through that it's been really cool to see business stuff like all of it's come through that yeah so it's been quite cool so anyway I saw the Iraq stuff liked it wanted to get it but then I guess they were smart too because they kept seeding it to cool looking people online i kept seeing people talking about it in comments on like you know the accounts like supreme drops and whatnot and it felt like it was getting hyped i was like damn it i didn't think it was being hyped i didn't think iraq were like the hyped graffiti crew of the scene or i didn't think people cared about as much as i did but obviously they did which is probably why supreme could collaborate with them but um the the interest started to build up and i was like damn man and i saw a leak about the gloves not really being that you know not me not many of them being made or not many of them being available on the first drop i was like oh, i'm only going to try once you know realistically i'm not going to be on my computer or phone all the time checking for drops and stuff i'm going to try when they drop the first release and then if i can't get them did i'm just going to be done with it but i really wanted to get the iraq and mechanic gloves because of see some of you know i bought a bike and i've been riding that quite often now and i have that kind of in my kind of daily cardio stuff that i do and it's a, basically a fixie and i've been wearing at the moment these kind of classic mechanic gloves i had another pair but i lost them but i've been wearing these kind of classic black mechanic gloves with the sort of print on the outside kind of similar to what sting would have wore back in the day when you were i'm not sure if he still wears them but they basically come with like writing the mechanic on them and usually you wear them black and white but i just had the black and black ones and obviously, Iraq uh, put their collaboration out and I really wanted them and I was lucky enough to get them on the day of release, lucky enough. Um, the website was being a bit buggy and whatnot, but overall, I was able to get on the website. No, I think I got all the off my phone, off of the, on the, flipping the, the mobile version of the site, which obviously worked far better than the desktop version for some reason. I was able to cut them and get them in the post and now they've arrived. So here they are. 
the Iraq and Supreme Mechanic gloves. And the model is different because I actually thought they were based on this model that I have here, which is, I don't know what, what model this actually is because I cut off the label. But I thought it was going to be based on that model, but it's not. It's a different type of model. And if anything, I'm a little bit disappointed on the quality because I, I, I don't know why, but I assumed it would be a better print. But essentially, it feels like a digital... Is it, yeah, so it feels like a digital print of some extent. I thought maybe the fabric would be... I don't know, I just had a different idea of what the fabric would look like, but it's a little bit more digital printed, I guess because it's made of neoprene or whatever this material is, but you've got this kind of, you know, Iraq motif kind of splayed all over it with loads of kind of little supreme little hits here and there, but that's essentially what it is. So for $40 or for £40, they're a little bit, you know, a little bit expensive for what they are but for someone like myself that's going to be getting a lot of use out of these i'm going to be wearing these flipping every single day that i'm riding my bike so you know i'm clearly the target audience for something like this and i'm, and I'm also going to be doing a little dj mix hopefully soon no hopefully on friday where i'm going to be wearing these as well zooming into them so you can be able to see them in action as i flip in play and so that's going to be a bit of good content to put out there wearing these sort of things too so and i think because uh, i still regret not getting the flipping franklin supreme batting gloves from last season the ones that came in like white black and red like oh so good and they're like 170 pound or something now so i'm happy that i've kind of got these i really really am so these came in the post over the moon with them yeah, of course, the standard thing I've got to do later on is I'll take out the tag and cut this. It's got this really long wash tag thing that I don't need to have on there. It's annoying every time you put it on. Nice little hang tag reg there. But I would have liked a little bit more detail, like, you know, like little splatters of Supreme, maybe two maybe two labels here would be would have been nice maybe a little Supreme box logo here on the table. It's just something. They just look like, you know what they look like? They look like if Mechanic had an ID system. Like imagine Mechanic had an ID little thing where you could basically get gloves and you could select your own colours and put prints on them or whatnot and then get them sent to you in six weeks. This is what it looked like. It looked like this. Jeremy, there's nothing really that different. I guess if you use this base model, if I was to go and buy this base model, I bet you it's, it's the same. There's no difference in terms of the usually Supreme do that though when they collaborate. They usually change little things. But maybe Supreme this is Supreme saying, Hey, this version, this base model of this glove is good. We're just going to add our brand into it. But the base version is the best glove you're going to get. But I would, I don't know, I would always prefer a little bit more. Do you know what I mean? But overall, not too bad. And then of course, in the packet, because I only just bought those, um, I got this in terms of sticker packs. I got the Mark Gonzalez Supreme Team thing. Got this weird um, picture of some woman's bum. I'm not so sure if that girl's underage or not, but it looks really sus. And then I've got a red box logo ticker as red box logo sticker in there also so i'll be able to stick on those on my things soon rather soon rather soon but yeah those are the gloves that i copped happy i got them happy i got them now moving on let's talk about the news that everyone wants to talk about what's happening with kanye west or as people are calling him on the internet kunye it's wild to hear white people call Kanye a coon. And it's like, it's really interesting. Uh, a white person calling any black person a coon online is ridiculous. Or even just in general. It's just, we live in crazy times. But hey, we are where we are, innit? So Kanye had a fashion show a couple of days ago for Yeezy Season 9. It was something that was announced kind of out of the blue. Um, I think rumblings were starting to stir once he just basically started attending all the fashion weeks. But he was doing that quite often last season also. He just kind of, you know, putting his face about and being about in the scene and industry a lot more, especially post Virgil Abloh's death, which I'll touch upon later. I actually got some things to talk about that as well. But in general, he was kind of around. And of course, the news got leaked that he was going to show again Yeezy Season at Paris Fashion Week, which is, you know, widely regarded as the top, the press, the, resi the pièce de résistance in terms of um, fashion weeks out there because, you know, they have also, you know, women's fashion wear, obviously, in Paris Fashion Week, super important, but also the showrooms in and around Paris, mostly around men's stuff, mostly around streetwear and menswear and all that sort of good stuff. People go there because a lot of accounts turn up there in places that you want to be kind of situated and next to. Even a brand like Trapstar, which is, I would say, as far away removed from Paris Fashion Week as anything is out there. They had a, like a dinner sort of pop-up event type thing over there too. So clearly there's a lot of buzz around Paris in terms of getting your face there, being seen, bloody blah, blah, blah. blah. Kanye does it, Kanye knows it, he did a thing and he presented the show. Now, the show itself was pretty forgettable, to be completely honest. The clothes are what they are. Just, you know, it's the same things you've seen before from Kanye and Yeezy. Um, just now he's basically adopting more of a black sort of a colour palette. Loads of granites, loads of uh, 
greys and bronzes and whatever just variation of blacks and charcoal and whatever it may be but it's the same shapes um for me personally i think in this show he's saying there was no um zips everything was pull over a pull on type of thing but the real thing that really ticked people off immediately when he was doing the show for what ticked me off first of all was the kids choir thing there's like a sunday service kids choir thing and their northwest was in the choir singing looking cute and singing her voice out but overall when it comes to kids choir unless you girls sound like the temptations or the kids i don't want to hear it it sounds awful maybe because i spent too much time in the church i spent basically 18 years of my life in the church essentially indoctrinated having to go to church flipping three times a day sometimes like insane amounts sunday school all that stuff i had enough of it so the fact that he's now discovered christianity all of a sudden you know in his mid 40s i don't care i have no interest in it whatsoever so when i'm seeing kids you know bellowing their hearts out and trying to catch these notes i'm like count me out so i'm already out of it then it just continues it keeps going on and on i was a shit this is the soundtrack for the fucking show all right cool let's listen to these kids fucking destroy these songs right they're doing it <laughs> they're doing the thing the the what you call it the choir leader's trying to, his best to kind of get them in tune and make them not whatever that follow directions but then you know the, forget all that the thing that really set everyone off was the beginning when Kanye is d decides to come out and essentially rant and rave at his audience, they kind of it's been it's in this venue where it kind of looks like he's in a coliseum, which was maybe done by a purpose, not too sure. But the venue is like these spiral staircases, as this open plan sort of space at the bottom floor where he's standing at, and then everyone else is on these little uh, balcony foyer bits. I don't know what they called, right? And they were kind of in a circle, so it kind of looked like a Roman coliseum, and he was there like baying for blood, right? And he was shouting at people in the in the audience. I know these are fashion kids variety people. I saw John Galliano, I saw Hamish Bowles, I saw Anna Wintour, I saw Edward Innerfall, like loads of savage people, of course, Naomi Campbell walking the show. Everyone's legit. He's shouting, they're bellowing them. But then the most important thing where he's shouting at them, he's wearing a t shirt, a long sleeve t shirt. Everyone kept saying it's a hoodie. It's not a hoodie, long sleeve t shirt that had on the back of it White Lives Matter in big white font. And I think at the front of the shirt, it had a picture of John Pope II. It was this kind of weird, like, merch design t-shirt kind of thing with his face, you know, superimposed a couple of times, looking different directions and some candles and shit. And, you know, just Google John Pope the second controversy and you'll see some interesting articles on him involving kids involving charities and stuff so i don't know if he was if that's a good thing or a bad thing but that's the shirt and i'm not going to set people off but when i saw it in initial reaction was to laugh my initial reaction was to laugh and to also agree with the overall sentiment because what i thought when i first saw this because i've been paying attention when the news what's been happening with the black lives matter organization not the movement let's talk about that the organization was that it's been you know it's been heavily publicized and heavily kind of exposed that the people behind it or some people associated with black lives matter organization are crooks as are most people who work in these well-established charities right which is why people always say when you go and give money to charities and stuff you should really look into where the money is going to what sort of actions are going to be taken once you give them money like really discernible one two three stuff in terms of what's going to happen because for the most part it feels like from the looks of it how prevalent it is it's very easy to get away with swindling people's money um especially well-intentioned people's money because they just want to do the right thing they want to give it to you they don't even want to ask any questions so it's the easiest kind of robbery especially when people are in pain so all, all these articles out there about kanye sorry about black lives matter organization being crooks and people behind it basically profiting on it for their own personal gain buying mansions and stuff and all this sort of nonsense so we know that conversation doesn't exist so my first thing when i saw that was like oh yeah that's him essentially poking fun at this organization that's my initial thing it wasn't like he was like saying white lives matter and being like a flipping white nationalist or whatever it may be because you know by definition he cannot i just thought that was a kind of a bigger conversation around hey you said black lives matter organization now white lives matter do you know what i mean that kind of thing that's why i thought he was kind of going with it but obviously this man's um kind of insistence this kind of rejection of intellectualism right and i think cultural overall there's this kind of war on intellectualism there's a war on authority figures on people that actually know what they're talking about everyone's kind of got a voice i think this is what's kind of led to this because this is the same dude who says he's proud to say he doesn't read books so it's not surprising that he'd put out a t-shirt like this with no context no explanation no background no nothing 
then get pissed off when people get pissed off about it. It's, it makes complete sense. You know? It's a typical Kanye thing to do, especially this version of Kanye. Put something out like this to get people annoyed and then get surprised when they're annoyed or get annoyed that they're annoyed. Like, it just doesn't, you know, you can't get in sweetness. So of course, the reaction online when he put this out was, ugh, people were going insane, right? They were not having it in the slightest. They wanted to absolutely beat him up. Obviously, he's there wearing the... Ricardo Tishi uh, designed Burberry sandals, which ironically enough, these might be his legacy at flipping Givenchy. Sorry, at Burberry. Ricardo Tishi, one of the most legendary, well-respected, talented designers in the industry, has absolutely you know fluffed it at Burberry for whatever reason. And again, it's another topic for another podcast. But I'm obviously super interested and intrigued about what actually happens to people like that. Or like, what's the cause of that? It's happening to Nicholas Gasquet at Louis Vuitton. It's happened to flipping Ricardo Tishi at Burberry. What happens to these really high-level designers? Why is it suddenly they wake up and they just can't design good clothes anymore? The stuff they put out on the runway is just terrible was it that they had a better support system at their prior job like Nicholas, Nicholas Gasquet is a good example did he have better team at Balenciaga and then suddenly he goes to Louis Vuitton and it's a different team and he hasn't got the same amount of talent around him um, Ricardo Tichy he just ran out of the the good juices and he you know didn't was able, wasn't able to kind of recreate the magic that he had at Givenchy back in the day what actually happens I'd love to know but anyway regardless he's wearing the legacy of Ricardo Tichy on his feet and doing his damn thing have a good picture and then of course you see this picture at the end as well that um kind of someone decided to put up on her inter on her twitter too with them both wearing the white lives matter t-shirt one in white one in black with the with the flipping logo in the back and then what i want to say where is it oh yeah, of course the reaction to it wasn't the great so everyone kind of going you know the typical response that you think people would have to against it because of course no context was given everyone was kind of shouting at each other so that made complete sense um and then continuing on and then what actually kind of really i think set people off and got make people really pissed off about the entire thing was Kanye then decided because people were angry and pissed off he was angry and pissed off and one of the people that didn't like it at the time when they showed the show was this lady here on the right and her name is gabriella karifa Car johnson who is the what is it global fashion director i think of vogue overall so somebody is quite prominent in the industry somebody that a lot of people have got a lot of time for i think if i'm not mistaken i saw articles of her in the past that she's a very good stylist again i'm not really too familiar with the lady at all i don't really check for vogue in that way but from what i can read online very well regarded very well rated has her own clout has her own name you know whatever whatever the deal is but kanye clearly didn't like the fact that she has some bad things to say about his collection or about the, you know the the t-shirts in general and then i think the first thing that she put out was this yeah the first thing the first thing she put out was this right my thoughts shared with the friend which was a selection of screenshots of her dming other friends uh, you know about the show that she was watching in real time she said the following what i feel like what what i feel is that he's not fully aware of the difference between approaching so appropriating blm and subverting the make america great again hat although i disagree with his thesis there i understand his idea that the hat was a ready-made and its value was intrinsic to context signature of the artist when worn by trump it's racist when work when work by when worn by kanye it's about liberation um, he neglected to realize the importance of the object when he tried to extend the, that kind of subversion to BLM slogan. One subject, uh, one is object, one is ethos. To be fair, I think she's being overly charitable to him even in this part. But anyway, this this basically proves she's an actual nice person. It continues. I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to illustrate the dystopian world in the future when the whiteness might become extinct, or at least we would be enough to endanger to demand a defense. And the other screenshot is what uh, is what justifies mass incarceration murder and our mass and indeed even the advent of slavery the idea that blackness must be snuffed out or will is so surely supersede whiteness in power and influence if given the chance and it's so hugely irresponsible to furnish the dangerous extremist with this kind of fictional narrative the added layer of him having kids from this his donda school performing the soundtrack it really felt like the divide between the indoctrination and education has never been finer which i agree with i said already the fucking performance from the kids was terrible just sonically but obviously she made a far better and more succinct and intelligent point in that regard and then gabriella continues to kind of you know put a real pin a real punter a real period at the end of that conversation that she had with a friend that she was sharing so it follows 
It's become clear that some viewers think my previous post containing my working, evolving um, thoughts on Kanye's show was some sort of distorted justification for incredibly irresponsible and dangerous act of sending White Lives Matter t-shirts down the runway. Please understand, it wasn't. The t-shirts this man conceived, produced and shared with the world are pure violence. This is no excuse. There's no art here. I'm sorry. I failed to make that clear for I did. I sorry to make that clear. I thought I did. I do think if you asked Kanye he'd say that there was art and revolution and all of those things in that t-shirt there isn't and as well as um and as we all work through the trauma of this moment especially most of uh, of those of us who suffered in those rooms let's have some grace for one another now personally for me I'm a big believer that words are not violence maybe it's a maybe it's a dude thing um, maybe because you know essentially guys always have an underlying threat of violence when they are kind of going back and forth and arguing with each other you know at any point it could go left very quickly there is no kind of you know you're never going to see a continual Nicki Minaj and Cardi B type of beef with guys it doesn't get to that point eventually hands will be you know thrown um, sometimes in America guns will be toted sometimes here in the, U in the UK or parts of Europe a knife will be pulled out it gets really extreme so when people tell me words of violence i don't agree because i know especially when it comes on the internet i can turn the internet off i can leave social media i can whatever not decide to read your review but when it comes to actual violence those are things that are you know are going to impact me physically and things that maybe in some cases i can't necessarily avoid but you know whatever this is another political conversation i don't want to get involved in but the post that really i rated people and i thought myself was incredibly distasteful was this post that kanye put out regarding when you obviously saw the comments of that lady made and it's as follows there's a picture of this gabriella girl and i think this is the outfit she actually wore to the show and you know maybe you say the outfit's frumpy maybe you don't like the outfit itself it is a fair comment to make but him basically dismissing her worth because in his opinion he doesn't like what she wears and because essentially what he's trying to say without being because again you know Kanye like, likes to act like he's a big dog and he can say what he wants but he doesn't necessarily say what he wants because you know he's still scared to piss off certain people but what he actually wants to say is that she's a fat and ugly woman that what he really wants to say right he doesn't find her attractive he thinks she's fat and she can't dress so in those boxes with unticked with the x on them she, and obviously she's not richer than him and obviously that means she can't comment on what he has to say or anything at all because you, you, again this is this is kind of a going away for the point but you didn't he, see him give the same amount of vim that he gave her that he cared to flip in fucking gg did did you and i wonder why so let's continue but the, the caption says as follows Kanye West posts of a picture of her wearing an outfit and it says, this is not a fashion person. You speak on Ye, I'm a speak on you, Ox Trevor Noah, right? Whatever that means. I think he thinks he dunked on Trevor Noah because Trevor Noah had a difference of opinion in terms of how he was going about things. Who knows? This is Kanye's world. So that obviously pissed people off. People weren't too happy about it. Um, and then, of course, that led to a series of people kind of coming out and defending Gabriella, which I felt was absolutely incredible to see in the fashion industry because we don't see that often enough when people are kind of getting um, bombarded and targeted. Usually it's from the fucking brands and the platforms themselves, not really from fans and other artists and other designers. But this is an interesting point in time, especially considering the relevancy and, uh, you know, the command of, of no, let's say, the clout that he Kanye basically has amongst fashion brands and platforms and stuff because they know he generates clicks and whatnot. So people are kind of, you know, hesitant to call him out because they don't want to risk not having him kind of show up and bump their numbers and all that sort of stuff because, you know, considering what he said about the fashion industry in general, the fact that he's still able to have the likes of Anna Winter and all those likes turn out to his show must mean he's held in some regard of any industry. But then I thought one of the more interesting sort of uh comments and feedback to kanye was the comment from fucking gg Hadid. i thought that was absolutely stupendous i really did and it really kind of um exposed and cut deep what the overall issue i feel like in a scene is regarding all this sort of stuff right um and this is a post that kanye put up that he deleted where it shows him um receiving a text from the designer and obviously one of the models that was in a show called moa lola and she posted the following as a text message to him i also don't think you should insult that writer you could actually have a real conversation about the t-shirt and this is a looks like a new text maybe it's a new phone but i find it quite telling that a lot of the texts that he posts i guess maybe some he crops out but for the most part they look like it's the first time these people have spoken to him like via text message 
So either he doesn't like people talking to him or people don't talk to him or he doesn't have actual real friends. But it's interesting that there's always like, there's not a lot of texts to kind of go through. It's just like the first text message ever sent to him. Anyway, in the comment section of that post, GJD said the following. You wish you had the percentage of her intellect. You have no idea. Ha ha. If there's actually a point to any of your shit, she might be the only person that could save you. As if, as if the honor of being invited to your show should keep someone from giving their opinion. You're a bully and you're a joke. Also, we've got that absolute redact in the bottom, that flipping produced by Zach Guy trying to clutch it off the back of Kanye, which has been embarrassing to say the least. But I thought that was a pretty decent call out overall, and it kind of exposed the really. And of course, that's the other response that Kanye did. I know, Kanye, I know Anna hates those boots, which is awful. And then um. The last thing I wanted to quickly touch upon that I thought was pretty interesting about this whole thing. Oh, yeah, it was the Tremaine stuff. <clears throat> so off the back of all that stuff happening with Gigi and Kanye, we've got this flipping crazy stuff, right, happening with um, Tremaine and Kanye West, which, again, I said exposes, I feel like, the overall nonsense of the fashion industry, personally for me. Because I've said for a lo the longest time, and I was saying this, I've been saying this for a while, ever since maybe, ever since maybe um, uh, racism sorry um save it was a choice i was saying that from then especially from an outsider's point of view especially being somebody that's a huge Kanye west fan somebody that you legitimately used to run home to watch clips of him ranting you know at, on his shows and stuff because i felt those cult, those kind of rants to be super inspirational um somebody that was rooting for him in terms of him getting ownership and being able to produce the stuff that he wants to produce on level he wants to produce it at i was one of those vocal people out there kind of you know, as other Kanye West fans, kind of defending him, quote, quote, online. But when he started to heel turn and become this person he was, I quickly distanced myself from him as a person, just said, you know, I'm just going to enjoy the stuff that he puts out. I'll separate the art from the artist because I've kind of been lucky enough because of maybe my interest. I have a lot of things that I'm interested in where there's a lot of questionable individuals, a lot of questionable publications, sponsors, whatever it may be. And I had to do that a lot, that dance of separating the art from the artist because most of the stuff I listen to, you know, if you really dig deep and kind of do the homework and do the research, do the science, a lot of these people, men or women, are very questionable, right? Morally, ethically, whatever it may be. So I found it hard, easy to do that. But more people haven't, but a lot of people haven't found it so easy to separate both. If they don't like you as a person, it's very hard for them to support you as the art. And I know that for a fact to be a lot of people's stance in the scene, like industry people, I know that a lot of them are you know, they're quite aligned politically. They're quite aligned in terms of their worldview. They're quite aligned in terms of their priorities, in terms of their interests and goals. They all kind of have the similar sort of thing. They like to pretend they're all different, but generally they're the same. And I knew for a fact, these guys behind the scenes don't like what this guy's doing, but they're not saying anything publicly. They're just remaining stum. They're going to all the flipping listing parties. They're make, maintaining their own, that flipping easy seed list, but they're not saying a jack shit. They're not saying anything. And it really used to aggravate me. I used to say, I mentioned it online on Twitter, like these guys are like throwing subs and whatnot, but not saying anything publicly. They don't want to ruin their link or connect with Kanye. They don't want to ruin their exceeding list opportunity really easy, but they're letting him get away with all this bullshit. But then they want to call out the white man, the kind of the boogeyman that exists over there. But it's like, bruv, this guy's doing fucking worse fucking damage if you want to go down that route. Right, Jeremy? You know I mean? Because he's somebody that's actually of the culture. He's actually somebody that, you know, has played an instrumental role in these people's lives and whatnot. I don't think that head of youtube or whatever is doing that much whatever it don't matter let's move on from that one but it was so cool so refreshing to see somebody that's actually associated with kanye an actual close friend of his and somebody that's been around them overall tremaine emery who's obviously the founder of denim tears um step up and say something about the situation because i feel like this has been this has been something that a lot of people are wanting to say, but they've not had the guts or the balls to say it, basically, not had the courage. Or maybe it's because Kanye in general does do this thing where he purposely doesn't have people around him that disagree with him. He doesn't like to explain himself too tough, as you've seen. He doesn't like to articulate his points. He just wants you to accept what he says, like in a tyrannical way, and that's it. So maybe how he acts pushes people away. But I do have the feeling that a lot of people around him have enabled him to the point where he is this person that he is now. Because I'm, I'm going to be controversial with this as well and say, I don't necessarily think it's a good or bad thing. I'm not, I don't care about these people that deep. It's not good or bad. It's just at this point in time, he's this person. But I know these guys behind the scenes don't like this person, but they pretend like they do because they want to be like down. You know what I mean? They want to make sure they're not 
basically putting another black man down in public, which I understand the sentiment behind it, but I just don't like the double standards. You can't not not comment on stuff that he says or does that's detrimental, but then you want to point at the boogeyman over there. It's like, no, comment on the person right next to you. Do you know what I mean? That guy's doing just as much damage, if not more. But anyway, regardless, Tremaine did step up and say something, so that's definitely something to be credited and noted whatever you thought. So obviously, as you can see from Tremaine's Instagram profile, he was obviously supporting... Um, Gabriella anyway right in his own way and I thought the most telling part was this little sub that he threw out where he basically took a screenshot of this term which I had no idea existed called a Judas goat and it's as follows a Judas goat is a trained goat is uh, is a trained goat used in general animal herding the Judas goat is trained to associate the sheep or cattle leading them to a specific destination in stockyards a Judas goat will lead sheep to slaughter while its own life is spared Judas goats also used to lead other animals to specific pens and onto trucks they have fallen out of use in recent times but can still be found in very smaller slaughterhouses in some parts of the world as well as con conservation projects Cattle herders may use a Judas steer to serve as the same purpose as a Judas goat. The technique and term originated from the cattle drivers of the United States in the 1800s. The term is a reference to Judas Iscariot, an apostle of Jesus Christ who betrayed Judas in the Bible. So pretty self-explanatory. So it's basically Tremaine calling Kanye a Judas goat, right? He led us to this place, but eventually he was always going to lead us to our downfall. And obviously Tremaine here supporting um, Gabriella here putting the quotation marks of beautiful in the caption obviously lending uh, a kind of nod to Virgil Abloh you know which is pretty cool to see and then of course the final post which is the death nail the real blow that I think exposed the whole sham that is the flipping industry the culture the scene streetwear wherever it may be is this post here because we all knew this deep down I knew this deep down having analysed and seen certain things and keeping my own things and obviously being a fan and caring about this stuff way more than I actually should I had a feeling this stuff was obviously the case but someone pointing out that in plain black and white is pretty trippy so it's just Tremaine's post where he basically um takes a screenshot of Kanye's post where that he deleted where he said the following Kanye said spank my hand with rulers I'll go sit in the principal's office can't we talk about more important things like how the late show was or Bernard I know killed my best friend everyone's got a right for the opinion right there's mine so Kanye is essentially saying but I don't know what's the reason why he can't Virgil Abloh passed away. like is it even worth entertaining the idea no but that was his kind of interpretation of the events and whatnot and how he feels and Tremaine laid it out pretty plainly said the following I gotta draw a line at you using Virgil's death in your Yay's the Victim campaign in front of your sycophant peanut gallery <laughs> algorithm. And you know what's funny about this? Just before I continue, I had a feeling something untoward happened between them because I was actually watching a lecture, I think, that Denim Tears did on the Off White channel, I think. No, it wasn't Off White channel. I think it might be the Virgil Abloh YouTube channel. There's like a series of lectures there where he basically gets a lot of his friends to give lectures or to give like, um, what are they called? mentoring kind of lectures or whatever um things on their in on their career trajectory on their inspirations on their brand just to kind of lend support to i forgot the charity that virgil Abloh supports behind it but it's a pretty cool series there's one with heron preston there's one with um uh tremaine on there also and he mentioned he was basically going through his cv and saying the stuff that he's done jobs wise it got very detailed in it right shared a lot of kind of personal details i don't think he shared before in other interviews and he specifically said in that interview or in that presentation i was at yeezy i got fired from that like he said something like that in that kind of way and if you know anything about seeing people no one mentions how they got fired why they got fired if they got fired in places you know people always hush hush you just try and play the clout and politic game and fake it to make a game but the fact that he made a point to say that he left or he got fired i forgot which one i think it was fired I was that huh that must explain a lot then because i don't really see him regularly with kanye as much as he was in the past he was like he was like kanye's um he was like Kanye's uh, ASAP Bari. Now that ASAP Bari has become like, you know, the, the new Tremaine, like in terms of being his kind of guy, right? And you haven't seen him with them together a lot. Um, he doesn't really post about Kanye stuff on his Instagram at all anymore. It's just all Virgil stuff, right? Which is weird. But I knew something was off. So this explains a lot of it. It continues the caption. Your best friend, Virgil. 
Negro, please. This time last year, you said Virgil's designs are a disgrace to the black community in front of all your employees at Yeezy. Arcs, lit, l, l, how do you say it? Lucette, Lucette Holland, I guess that person's name is. I got all the receipts. Don't let me get into the things you said about Virgil after his death. Yay, tell people why you didn't get invited to Virgil's actual funeral, the one before the public one at the museum, and why you weren't allowed to speak at the public funeral. You knew Virgil had terminal cancer and you rode on him in group chats, at Yeezy, at interviews, on songs. You are so broken. Keep Virgil's name out of your mouth. Keep Gabriella's name out of your mouth. You're not a victim. You're just an insecure narcissist that's dying for validation from the fashion world. Take care. At least we'll have always have Uganda. I'm not sure if Uganda's a reference to him going there and running amok and giving free shoes to that dodgy president or prime minister. I don't know how it works in Uganda. I'm not sure if that's the case, but regardless. That is a pretty brutal and telling read and also exposes quite a lot of things that I had a feeling were happening behind the scenes that no one wanted to talk about because, again, like I said, Kanye seemed to have this weird grip on people where essentially he bought their silence with collaborations. I don't know what's happening there, but it just seemed odd. But essentially, all these guys are quite politically aligned. So to have somebody that is so... It's so sort of like opposite what they think in terms of polit politics and societal. It just didn't make any or societal issues. So it just didn't make any sense why they didn't say nothing publicly. But again, they all kind of get encouraged now to start saying things openly. The obviously the telling part in all of this, the really hard bit to take, especially if you're a Kanye West fan, and obviously if you're a fan of virtual like I am, clearly as you've seen the stuff on my channel is the comments around Virgil Abloh's death and about their friendship or their lack of um, during the time he was alive and obviously um, during the time he was sick as well. That's really telling, really bloody telling. Um, the fact that he's making a point to say that this guy, Kanye, was disparaging Virgil to everybody that would basically lend him an ear. The same way that he tries to, you know, tell his life story or try and get everyone to swipe his problems where he's on radio doing interviews he obviously does that in private too so anybody that's willing to listen to him rant about the industry and why he isn't where he needs to be and bloody blah, blah 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 would hear him disparage virgil's name and what is clear to me at least i think most people would agree with this what is clear at least to me is that that whole virgil getting the louis vuitton job damaged their relationship more than anyone will ever know more so on the side of Kanye because I feel like for whatever reason Virgil seemed to be the consummate professional he had a very forgiving spirit overall you know him getting dunked on during that whole time with the whole five dollar donation thing during the whole um George Floyd RIP protests that were happening in the states like so many negative things in the press he seemed to be incredibly forgiving he didn't hold grudges at all that was just the nature of the game he just kept it moving so I would imagine most of it was mostly on Kanye side but it needs to be said that that whole him not getting the job or sorry Virgil getting a job before Kanye definitely ruined their relationship to the point where Kanye was still holding on to that grudge on Virgil's deathbed bruv on his deathbed he was holding that grudge still and that I think is the clearest example of him being a pretty disgusting human being pretty vile and the thing that annoys me about this whole thing for the most part is that what it also proves is that they all knew this all these friends and collaborators knew that he has how an awful guy he is. I think they said about people behind their back, but they didn't say a word. Not 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 an inch. Nothing. Zero. They all pretend like they didn't hear it. They all minding their business and stuff. But when it comes to other issues, societal issues, things in culture that you know that are a bit more far removed from them, they're the first to speak up and say something. And even now, in the in the kind of residue of this beef. I think Tremaine's been the only vocal person from that whole scene of whole collective of people around him who's actually said something with his whole chest. There have been people who have left comments buried in someone else's page you have to kind of dig through or somebody has posted their own story but somebody has actually posted something on their main feed and actually made their point known. And as he said, Tremaine in the caption here, he's drawing a line in the sand. He's the only person to do it so far. So you have to give the guy props. The only person to do it. Everyone else is kind of running scared and doing what they're doing. And then of course... Kanye is doing what Kanye does and essentially he's saying that I think he's saying in the in one of the posts I remember him reading something along the lines of he thinks that Bernard Arnault the CEO of the you know whatever of flipping LVMH is the person behind sending Tremaine to kind of attack him because Tremaine was the supreme 
But the funny thing about it is that LVMH don't own Supreme. It's VF Corp. VF Corp. Sorry, completely different company, completely different venture capitalists, or whatever you want to call them, right? So he obviously is confusing them. Either he's confusing the two companies, or Kanye is inadvertently leaking news that LVMH are gonna be buying Supreme. I'm not know, but either way, it's a fucking bizarre thing to say because essentially he didn't address any of the points that Tremaine made in his post. Zero. The accusation that he was talking bad about Virgil, you know, during his time when he was at Louis Vuitton, before he got the job, when he got the job, when he was sick, when he was approaching death and even post death. He hasn't addressed any of those things, but he basically said, oh, you know, but I don't know, sent you kind of thing. And it, it, it's war, so they're going to send my friends. But the most trifling thing about the entire thing, I think the most thing that really kind of pissed most people off was this post. So all this stuff happens and then he decides to kind of get online and do this fake sort of grandiose version of gaslighting where he posts a picture of um, Gabriella uh, taken from the, I think, business of fashion that basically highlights people in fashion who, you know, doing good work. Um, I think she's one of the 500 people, quite a cool little, you know, profile picture there in black and white. And he takes that screenshot and says in the caption, Gab is my sister. So trying to fake affinity with somebody he doesn't know, because I guess that's what people call her, Gabby Gab, I guess if you are one of her friends, is it's just it's just disgusting. The disingenuousness is dripping from this post. But it continues. And it's gaslighting nature of it also because he's the one that started his beef. She shared her opinion on what she thinks on the shirt. It's a controversial shirt. You'll obviously want to cause controversy and conversation. She had her piece to say. It was pretty, I think, tame considering, you know, clearly politically and what how she looked at the world different to Kanye. The fact that she said that was quite a tame response. And he actually reacted, but then now he wants to have the apology and let everyone know that no no we're friends we're friends like oh god anyway this guy says the follows i'm not letting people go to bed thinking i didn't oh yeah let's uh, another point i got to bed this is on a monday this motherfucker disturbed our entire week with this shit and said absolutely nothing really nothing of any note um, anyway i says i'm not letting people go to bed thinking i didn't meet with gabriella no, sorry, Gabrielle, sorry, at 5 p.m. today for two hours, then went to dinner at at 30. Um, Anna had Baz Luhrmann film our meeting and we are editing tonight. So there's a thing, there's an actual movie edit, documentary video thing that's coming out of this, which shows, you know, that, and that flipping Anna Wintour head is screwed on in terms of always be generating content, always be putting out content. But for us as fans and viewers, it's a little bit gross. But it continues. We took pics and I was instructed not to post them. I felt like she was being used. It felt like she was being used by Trevor Noah and other black people to speak on my expression. <laughs> it's funny, this guy. Isn't it? He's just funny, man. He's just funny. Like, he, he you're, he's allowed to say what he wants to say, but you're not allowed to say what he's saying is shit. So, huh? Anyway, she expressed that her she expressed that her company did not instruct her to speak on my t-shirt expression. We apologize to each other um, for the way that we made each other feel. We actually got along and have both experienced the fight for acceptance in a world that's not our own. She disagreed. I disagreed. We disagreed. At least we both love Freddy and fashion. I don't know if that's a dig. I don't know what that is. That doesn't feel like a compliment, but regardless, that's what he said. And so basically they kissed and make up and now they kissed and make up he's basically saying you should leave me alone but then if you just scroll up a few posts he's attacking his wife's family which is not none of our business because you know that's your private business but still attacking his wife's family posting pictures of, you know sister-in-law and then the final post here at the top another picture of the white lives matter t-shirt with a caption here's my latest response when people ask me why did i make the t that says white lives matter they do so it's effectively him doubling down, tripling down on the whole disaster of an, an affair. Now, my conclusion to this overall, as I said, I feel like overall, what people have to accept is that this is the Kanye that you're going to get until the end of time. He's just changed as a person. It's unfortunate if you don't rock with him now because, you know, politically and societally, um, issue-wise, you don't align with what he says and what he gets down with. That's obviously a shame. But this is the guy he's always wanted to become, I think, in general. Um, you know, especially when it comes to him talking about ownership and money and resources and all this stuff and, you know, not, not having someone tell him what to do. This is essentially where he was always going to end up. So this is it. 
And I feel like people have need to kind of get to grips with it. I know it's heartbreaking and it's sad and stuff because of guy that you loved and champ or who's kind of champion the things you also champion for has basically fell out of touch or just changed as a person. It is what it is. And it's annoying, but that is essentially what the crux of this situation is. Now, my other problem with this whole thing, like I said previously, is I feel like a lot of his bad behaviors have been encouraged over the years or enabled by his friends. He doesn't have a lot of friends that call him out and stuff. Maybe it's by design. Maybe it's whatever else. But he's got so many yes men around him that he's essentially never been told that he's been a dickhead by his actual friends. His actual friends excuse his behavior. The only people that say he are dickheads are people that don't really know him too well. And he's able to kind of write them off. And now that he's a billionaire, he can write you off completely because he feels like if you're not richer than him, you can't talk about him about anything, which is an insane way to look at the world. But hey, that's how he looks at it. And I feel like all those things are curious. And the other thing I think that's really horrible is that quite clearly behind the scenes, people knew how this guy was. But they didn't want to say a thing because, you know, the industry is the industry. And I feel like that's the horrible side of things, like, which basically says that if you design cool clothes, if you make cool product, if you can sell out certain items, if you can sell tickets, people will basically excuse and ignore and will shut up about every other bad thing that you do. And, and to it gets really bad, like at this point, where it's, you know, it's getting consistent in terms of him trying to troll and outrage the public. People are getting bored and annoyed about it, blah, 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 blah. But he had to get to this point. Everything else before was okay. Like for me personally, I'm thinking of, I mentioned for for on the Twitter, I don't really see any difference. This is just me personally. Me, 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 me saying this, right? Personally, I don't see any difference between um, the flipping White Lives Matter t-shirt and the outrage that's been causing with people, right? And Kanye's fucking insane, insane photo shoot and meeting with fucking Donald Trump when all that stuff was happening over there in the States at the time. I don't really see any difference between this and this, personally. And none of those people that are talking now and have a lot to say about Kanye were as vocal as they are now about him. When he was sitting there saying, Trump is like my dad, he was hugging a man, he was showing him renders of a space, of an airplane that doesn't exist, that someone else made online and said, this could be the future, like crazy shit. This, to me, was worse, personally, at the time that it happened. It was definitely worse, far worse, but no one said a, a word because they wanted to go to listen party, they wanted to be on that easy seat and listen. Again, like I said, that really shows up the industry overall for being you know, lacking in principles, lacking in morals, lacking in backbone, um, and just having absolutely zero balls and courage, anything, because they all kind of are, you know, what, what's that thing called? They all, I won't say dictate, they all kind of ran by who pays their bills, by who aligns with them brown wise and all that stuff. That's all there is. There's nothing else that comes to the back of it. And I think that is definitely, <laughs> look at him in the post there. My MAGA hat is, even, even got a sign by Don John. This guy is a fucking, le and he's a fucking legend in all the wrong words and all the wrong ways. But the funny thing about it, I also remember, didn't he say once that he didn't actually throw them away? Like they're there in his house. He just, he's got them all redesigned in a certain shape that he was always proud of. And he just took them off because, you know, he got advised not to wear them because of violence and shit. But, He's got them in his house and if people chat shit, he's going to pull them out again. So I expect in the next couple of days, if he keeps getting backlash and he feels like black people don't like him, he's going to double down on it and get some more hats out and stuff. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. But either way, a pretty terrible situation all around for anyone that's a fan of his. It's a bit, you know, again, like I said, if you're a fan, it's a bit sad to see. But like I said, you just have to accept that this is the guy he is, man. He's changed. He's a different person. He's not the guy that you once loved. That guy is dead. R.I.P. that Kanye. This is a different Kanye. And if you want to be a fan of his, you have to accept this part of his personality. Or if you can, you have to do the whole separate the art from the artist. But to think that he's going to have a come to Jesus moment, he's going to change his mind, not going to happen. You know, like I said before previously, you couldn't tell Kanye anything when he was coming up. He was pretty headstrong, uh, pretty determined, pretty confident in his own ability. Hubris, delusions of grandeur, whatever you want to call it. But it worked out for him. If you couldn't tell him anything when he had nothing, right, in his mother's bedroom making beats, imagine now, billionaire, legit billionaire, popping brand, all the stuff that he's doing, like, he's not going to listen to you. If he didn't listen to you then, now he's definitely not going to listen to you. So this come to Jesus moment, awakening thing, not happening.
in the slightest. I'd never see it happening. So if you accept him for what he is or what people should be doing in culture, if you really dislike what he does, just ignore the guy. But again, people find it impossible to do that, incapable of. You see it a lot with the Kardashians. People, much people say they hear about them. They fucking dictate a lot of flipping column inches to what they have to say. So clearly that doesn't happen in culture overall. But, you know, that's just the nature of the game, isn't it? That's just the nature of the game. What's got to talk about here? Let me move on from that one. I think I've spoken about all that. I can speak about. I'll just move on to this one. This is cool. This is cool. Not really cool to talk about, but hey, let's go in this one. Let's go here. So, I was, I think, speaking. Who was I speaking to? I forgot I was speaking to, but I was speaking to somebody about this actually. Where well, I was like, it's really annoying how many instances they are, reports or stories of people suffering something untowards within a dance music scene, right? Whether it's, you know, something pertaining to an assault, pertaining to rape, pertaining to whatever else it may be. There's always these weird, horrible stories that you hear coming out that really kind of break your heart. And even when it gets really sad and really, you know, flipping horrible, the ones where it involves like kids taking drugs for the first time in passing away or somewhere, like just horrible things are spiking, things have been happening all over places. And I remember saying once naively, right? Really naive, you know, open eye, doughy eye kind of way. Why don't why can't we create our version of a utopia in nightclubs? Nightclubs are really a I've always thought like a safe haven for the freaks and the weirdos, right? If that or people that live an alternative lifestyle. If that's the case and it's only us that are in there, why can't we police each other to the point where we don't need outside resources? We don't need the outside people. We can police ourselves a way where we create this temporary um utopia where you can kind of escape to where if you have all the hell stuff going on in your everyday life your parents or your family or your culture your religion not accepting who you are and what your beliefs are and what you stand for you can at least go there to this place that is a kind of created and imagined utopia and let yourself free because there's no one taking pictures no one recording shit and trying to catch you out on certain stuff there's people that represent what you are lifestyle wise what you represent in terms of how you see yourself whatever it may be sexuality race color creed who cares you go to this utopia and you just unwind, you unplug from real life and you have some respite, you have some relaxation, you meet other people in the community that are just like you. That's the naive idea I had about nightlife. Then I remembered something my parents told me a while back when I kept going out loads. Nothing good happens after 9 p.m. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the reality of the world. You might want the world to be one way, but I've always said you always have to operate within the world as is not as the way you want it to be. Because I think sometimes that's where the kind of, you get that real weird uh, reality distortion thing happening where your brain just breaks because the idea you had of your world and you go outside, the world's different. It can kind of shatter everything about you and your perception of reality. Um, and I guess that's the problem that we have at hand is that fundamentally, with it being nightlife culture, with it being dance music culture involving clubs and that CD underground, you're going to attract some CD individuals who have some bad intentions and want to take advantage of people who are open-eyed, kind-hearted, and just want to get in the scene and have a good time and whatnot, or whatever, or whatever else they want to do. And I think this is a good instances and a good reflection and a good representation or example of it. So this is a story that broke at the beginning of the week regarding um asqueef and a, an artist on his label who's accusing him basically of assault and being a creep and it says as follows and i guess the person's account now has been private or something i tried to go i tried to find it but i couldn't so i guess either they've been private or i've been blocked but i think they've been private i'm pretty sure but it says as follows i'm coming on here to share my story of something that happened to me recently as a word of warning to others an explanation for why i might move back from london to glasgow Many of those closest to me already know and have known for a while as I kept it to myself, but I don't want to be silenced anymore. I am sick and tired of the music industry, music scene story being such an unsafe place, which is something that is really difficult to kind of wrap my head around, especially when you think of all these amazing, um, very specific niche club nights out at the moment. But it seems like however niche you get, however specific you get in terms of your appeal, the actual instances of untoward behavior or disgusting behavior actually ramp up. Think of places like, or people like establishments or groups like um, Possession. Good example, that party outfit out there in Paris. How many flipping things have come out from that group about people, you know, feeling like they haven't been paid or royalties owed, founders being chucked out? Like really strange things happen off the back of that. So 
it's it's just a weird it's just a weird thing you have to kind of get your head around. It continues. After being placed on a lineup with a DJ and a label owner, Asquith last year, we quickly became friends and we convinced and he convinced me to move to London for my music career. I put a lot of trust in him as he was over a decade my senior and had a lot of experience in the industry, so I did. Looking back, there were red flags in the beginning of our friendship, such as him sending me money and buying me things. But I was excited at the prospect of such a step up in my career that I thought it was just I was just being silly. It continues. Uh, come on, load up. There it goes. Shortly, um, shortly after my move to London, he invited me out for drinks, where we began to act extremely inappropriately and coerced me into going back to his flat, despite me repeatedly saying no. I felt pressured and feared of being stranded alone in a new city, and Ubers were failing to show. In general, as much as I want to say you want to be living in a utopia. There has to be, there has to be a general level of hesitation, scepticism, and just caution when it comes to you, especially if you're a young lady navigating in dance music scene. I know this guy is meant to be cool and he's got a meme page that everyone loves and whatnot, but just trusting somebody to this level that you don't really know, it's just wild, really, really wild. I understand maybe the music industry is different, because there is that kind of collaborative effort that goes into, you know, being a musician and you need everyone, you need people to support, you can't do it on your own. But there's a lot of red flags about this interaction also that don't sit right with me, especially if this was my friend. Hey, I'm going to go meet this guy. Like, why are you going to London to meet this guy? It's about a music career. It's 2022. You don't need to move anywhere to have a music career. You can fucking be successful in your own fucking bedroom if you want to. Um, maybe it continues. Immediately after we got to his, I was sexually assaulted. I was grabbed and I asked forcefully to perform sexual acts whilst he exposed and touched himself. Not once at any concert, not once was any consent made. I did not know how to react except froze up um, from fear. If, unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident and his inappropriate and controlling behaviours continued through messages in person in weeks that followed. For some examples included controlling how I ran my Instagram page, invalidation of my feelings and manipulating tactics. For this reason, I and others have left Lobster Ferriman, a uh, label which he employed me to work at, as I cannot begin to heal otherwise. I have chosen, I have also chosen to move back to Glasgow, as dealing with the situation alone in London has proven to be too difficult. And I think there was something in the comment about grooming also that I think I've missed out on, right? I think it's not there. Is there a grooming? Like, yeah, there was an accusation of grooming in there, which set me off because I don't necessarily think this is grooming, personally. Um, I think this is a situation of somebody taking advantage of someone, but I also don't think it's a grooming situation in that regard. It seems a little bit excessive to use that kind of language, but I get it. But overall, terrible, right? Absolutely terrible. And again, it's quite heartbreaking because like I said before, imagine being somebody that's open-eyed, doughy-eyed, naive, like I was in terms of saying, oh, I want the nightlife scene to be a fucking utopia that we create, you know, to kind of give us some, you know, temporary respite from the horrors of everyday life. And then you get into it and you realise it's a reflection of everyday life there's no getting away from it like monsters exist everywhere even in your scene even in your scene that you think is safe and cultivated like there's people spiking people in Bergheim that's meant to be one of the best clubs in the world with one of the strictest door policies ever and people get spiked in there allegedly you know there's some debate about it but in general people have instances where they feel like they're having a drink they're having fun and one minute they pick up their same drink and all of a sudden they're dizzy they don't remember jack shit it happens all the time cool that's the case so clearly, monsters exist absolutely everywhere. They definitely do. But I also have this feeling, and, you know, this is not me kind of, you know, being the flipping champion of victims here, but I have the feeling here, this is my little hunch, that this is not isolated incident. This is something that has been whispered around the scene here and there and said little ways here and there. So people are aware of this. I don't think this is a shock. This doesn't come as a shock to some people. And this is the issue that I have with it in general is that these things are never spoken about. These things are never highlighted. And if anything, it goes the opposite way. The people that actually get covered the most are the ones with maybe some questionable stuff in their flipping um, closet. 
but no one wants to mention it because usually those people are the ones that are like setting the trends in the dance scene they have the biggest label they have the best party they have the best club whatever it may be so people don't want to say nothing and the ones that suffer are the victims like this the silence that everyone has is what ends up having a victim at this see articles of this guy on fucking you know electronic beats looking cool doing this thing being promoted on the band camp page and whatnot bloody blah 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 and like oh sick this guy's cool oh he's sick he can boost my career oh sick someone in the label looks like me blah 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 but you don't know that behind the scenes the guy is an absolute monster allegedly you have no idea and i guess that's an issue that i have in general it's like there's not a lot of bravery out there the bravery only comes to the victims right the bravery doesn't really come from the scene industry they don't really protect people they don't at all they just leave you to the wolves and they give you this idea that all these things matter like these labels and stuff they don't at all the fact that the fact that somehow she was convinced into thinking she needed to move to fucking london in 2020 wherever it was 2021 2022 to pursue a music career especially as a dj a producer it's just insane you don't need to move anywhere. You can do it all from the comfort of your own home, wherever you are listening to this podcast right now or watching this. You can do it from wherever you are. You don't need anything. You just need a, a, a decent smartphone, a way to take pictures, um, and that's it. And an imagination. And you're off. You're done. You've done most of the work. You don't need anything. You don't need to move anywhere. Um, you can send files. So even if you need to go on a label, you can send them a file. You can you can be an artist under a pseudonym. You can wear a mask and be a flipping, you know, globe traded DJ and stuff and be doing what you need to be doing. So this idea you need a person is just something that obviously this guy uses a manipulation tactic and obviously something also the scene has done inadvertently with their praise that they heap on people in this sort of way, knowing deep down or hearing the whispers that these people also might be a little bit heinous behind the scenes. It really is kind of sick to be fair. And then the response from the guy was you know, it's the kind of response you kind of expect to hear from people that get accused of what they get accused of. So let's go and read through it. This is from Lobster Firm in the main account, right? My statement. I'm going to start by strongly refuting the allegations of sexual assault that have been made against me this weekend. There has never been any consensual non-contact between myself and Shona. And initially, I completely refute the allegations of grooming. Which I definitely, when I saw, I think I didn't see it on a podcast. I, I did think the grooming thing was a little bit, because I think the definition of grooming, you know, again, whatever, it's still gross. There's no even you know, fucking arguing over, you know, what shit is the stinkiest. Let's continue. The allegation of grooming are a constructed and distorted narrative of what was reality a very different situation. After meeting, hmm, the fact that he's holding on to it also makes me think this happened. The fact that he's holding on to the grooming, because I'm reading through it again, the fact that he's holding on to this um, misspeak that she did, because again, let's say that was an error. He's holding on to it super hard. It's just a little questionable. And anyway, it continues. After meeting at a gig in Scotland last year, I gave a significant amount of time and energy to support Shona in the early stages of her DJ and music career, as I have done with many artists over the years. We additionally became good friends and would converse almost daily. I like how he says that. Let's please comp let's please compare your d your your boy DMs with producers DJs to your girl DMs. Let's please compare them. I bet they're not the same. <laughs> Uh, anyway, she often vocalized. Uh, let's continue. She often vocalized. Yeah, she also vocalized to me in and, um, and publicly on Instagram that she had little to no money, and I was sometimes offered to help pay for train tickets and once bought her a T-shirt. This isn't out of ordinary for me to donate or pay for things this way, especially when it's related to friends and those who are involved with or with my music. On the night of the alleged incident, we had been having drinks at a bar and we were both intoxicated and on alcohol, having a good time and being a bit over the top. There had been some mild flirting, rude chat and occasional friendly contact, but nothing excessive and what and what I would describe or consider near the magnitude described here. Shona decided to stay to my flat and when we arrived, I checked up on my cut and then went to bed with nothing further occurring. So he's completely refuting the fact that he pulled out his little winker and was trying to get her to touch it or something. I think that's what he's basically refuting. In the months following um, this, this we maintained a good relationship. I continued to mentor her, which she accepted in a one a one day per week freelance role at Lobster, featured on Lobster Frame and Rinch Show, did a mix for Lobster Frame and Mix Series, as well as accompanied me to a gig in Scotland and also joined me to a festival performances where we were met friends and other artists. This feels like him saying. I gave you all these things and now you're trying to bury me online because I tried to move to you or something. This feels like a weird thing that like you can say, listing all the stuff that you did for somebody um, in response to them accusing you of sex. Like, 
he hasn't even tried to you know people when they because I understand he probably thinks that his point of view that he didn't do nothing wrong but in these instances you have to show a mollicum of flipping compassion right of sincerity of understanding or sensitivity and at least meet the people where they're at he hasn't met them at all where they're at he's like nah I didn't do it go fuck yourself crazy um, at the festival we shared a glamping tent and once again there was no inappropriate contact until a few weeks ago there had been uh, there had not been a single conversation about anything regarding non-consensual activity when Shona did first message me about this it was strictly via text and she refused to talk about the situation my response was to listen and try my best to understand and not to post my not to push my version of events on someone who's not in a good place I now realise that this was a naive decision to become to uh, uh, become personally and professionally involved with someone who I see that clearly as being see this guy's double speaking I don't like this this is a bit fishy I now realize that it was a naive decision to be to become personally and professionally linked with somebody who I see was clearly quite vulnerable so you didn't notice that before but you still were willing to move to her and stuff like it's just so weird isn't it these 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 niggas in the dance music industry are bizarre people it continues um I can understand the rush of the let it load up first. Bobbity 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 bomb. Come on, come on, my computer's a bit slow, please bear with me. Is it gonna load or is it? Is it gonna load? Come on, load. I right, question zoom in then. I can understand the rush of judgment given the severity of these accusations. However, there's a huge difference between being inappropriate or over the top and those accusations of sexual assault directed towards me. The people who know me know that I'm not that type of person in the slightest and thank, and I thank those of you who have supported me privately offering your support. <laughs> of course, privately. No one's going to come out and publicly support you. That's the thing that's awful about it. If you actually didn't do it, you want your public support. I don't want private support. Don't privately support me if I didn't do it. Like, leave me the fuck alone. Let me let me go through my dark moment myself. But, you know what I mean? You need public support because you're getting killed in the court of public opinion. Those who are those who are those, those, to those close to me who work with me and those eyes on Lobster, I'm sorry for the impact that these allegations may be having on you and this stress that is the beginning of uh, bringing to your lives. I intend to fight these with all my resources necessary to clear my name and I'll be available to cooperate with any additional or pro official process to address the situation. So, the thing that I have an issue with when it comes to these sort of things in general in general, for me personally, especially when it comes to the accused, especially when it's sort of those kind of weird non-apology things from people, is that for the most part, this is going to affect these guys and people the worst, right? The artists on the label who have done nothing wrong. They're just trying to pursue their career. They're trying to do what they're trying to do. Um, and then here is somebody, you know, who's the head of their label, essentially doing some very questionable things, right? Uh, being accused of questionable things. I feel like in this whole instance, even if you are legitimately innocent, it does really benefit your artist to take a step back and away from these sort of things and say clearly, hey, I'm pulling back and stepping back from this label. I have nothing to do with it for the foreseeable future until I kind of deal with this issue, you know, I have to do it personally, privately um, with the authorities so that they can continue doing their career because I've seen a lot of people basically get out some of these artists online on Instagram and basically rip them in the comments and say, why haven't you said nothing? Basically force them to make statements and stuff when some of these people... I'd imagine not all of them, but I think some of them are just maybe at the beginning of their career. Some of them are probably not making that much money at all. And to basically put them in a position where they have to sacrifice their career for a issue that wasn't something that they caused in the slightest is really unfair. And that really shows, in my opinion, bad leadership. Like, Asquith should have definitely said, hey, I'm not involved in this label now. Don't feel, like, uncomfortable not supporting them because of me. I'm going to deal with this stuff privately, but support the guys. It's nothing to do with this. That's how it should have been dealt with. But of course, when it comes to these sort of things, or someone's being this insistent on self-preservation, it gives me icky feelings. Because it means that maybe there is an element of this story that is really true, which is maybe the most important part of it. Maybe, you know, maybe you can argue and say, oh, you know, she was showing interest too at the beginning, whatever it may be, whatever his argument is. But the crux of what this girl is saying is that she felt like the relationship between the both of them was inappropriate. And I think like it goes back to the whole thing of, the dance music scene and just people working with other girls in general i think there just needs to be maybe a hard and fast rule especially in dance music especially when it comes to drinking and alcohol and, and drugs and nightlife stuff and people letting their inhibitions down and whatnot there needs to be a hard and fast rule that if you've got a label if you have if you have a club night if you run a club 
um, whatever it may be, you just have to make dating people that you work with just no, no. That is grounds for a firing. That is gross misconduct. That goes against our rules, whatever it may be. That just has to be something that you write in a contract because I feel like these sort of instances always seem to happen because people get comfortable. They feel they misread signals. They share space with people. They assume proximity means affection. Like all these weird blurred lines happen and you add drugs into the mix, alcohol into it. People get crazy and these things happen all the time. And unfortunately, the industry isn't there to help you because they promote people who they know categorically have done some sketch stuff in the past but because they generate clicks because they're popular or because the label pays them they put them up on a pedestal which then leads people again in small villages in scotland to look at the internet think this person's a, a big wig and is going to do something for their career and then move flipping however 100 miles away is to kind of pursue a career in something like dance music when you just do it from the comfort of your own home so it's a weird cyclical thing everyone is kind of to blame in a weird way but the, the apology from this guy is obviously terrible there's some red flags there in terms of what he's basically saying and not saying and emphasizing and whatnot but you know i just would have wished he would have stepped back away from the label a little bit to protect the artists on the label and it would have been nice if he would have been a little bit more sensitive to what this girl actually had to say about the issue and how she interpreted the interaction but you know these guys are not in the business of uh understanding and stuff it's all a little bit you know especially the, at the higher echelons of dance music it's all a bit take 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 you know what I mean? there's a lot of entitlement around there there's a lot of ownership and mm -hmm. so it's no surprise that these guys are really handsy and like i gave you this i gave you a mix series i gave you that i took it to a festival i gave you your gigs and it suddenly feels like it gives them a justification to do what they want with your body and whatnot it's just a bizarre 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 world really really is but the more you get closer to it, the more it hurts especially like it's the same with fashion like as much as i'm a fan of it and i'd love to have my own brand as much as i'd love to dj and like, would love to do that professionally the closer you get to it the actual business side of it the horrible it, the more horrible it becomes and honestly honestly does but um you know what can you do so hopefully you know fingers crossed that girl's getting all the support that she needs and fingers crossed that this ends up being a topic that we don't have to talk about you know a lot more time because uh, i don't know man for me it's a bit it's a bit nasty i gotta be honest it's a little bit nasty it's a little bit nasty but yeah that is it excellent thing show episode number 605 thanks again for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company as per usual for your first time check out the show you know what to do smash like it subscribe and all that lucky um if you listen via the audio podcast you obviously hear that my tune of the day if you're watching via video you won't hear any of that it'll just end and go to black but i've enjoyed your company regardless peace 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 peace